multiple myeloma. I worked in the research lab of Ken Anderson and really focused on multiple myeloma also in Pittsburgh and coming to um, Columbia um, with a very strong background in cardiology, nephrology, um, pathology. I have to say they have a very strong pathology. I saw more and more amyloid patients and I have a huge amyloid population right now and I think that's the reason why David in, invited me to talk about amyloid. We also have a very interesting approach how to treat amyloid. We have a monoclonal antibody and I will spend half of my talk to give you a little bit an insight on the uh, newest developments of that monoclonal antibody present some data we have in a clinical research trial. Okay, so to kind of you know talk about amyloidosis, I think how do we make the diagnosis? How do we select the right therapy? That's important in amyloidosis. We use usually steal all the drugs from multiple myeloma, but uh, there are some I would say special. Uh, things in amyloidosis we have to take into account and we cannot just kind of you know use our approach from myeloma and, my and amyloidosis one to one. Um, I think what is really interesting is uh, the development of the monoclonal antibodies um, as in amyloidosis to help the body to break down the amyloid. So amyloidosis is a protein misfolding disease and what you can see here nicely, you can have uh, over 28 different proteins that are able to form amyloid. So that reaches from abnormal enzymes like lysozymes or proteins, apolipoprotein, transseratin, that's especially in older patients, the TTR amyloidosis, transseratin amyloidosis. But we usually deal with the light chain amyloidosis where free light chains form an abnormal protein. And typical for amyloid is the Congo red staining um, in um, another microscope and in polar polarized light microscopy you've seen the typical apple green staining for amyloid. So what types of amyloid we can have? In the beginning as I started to work with amyloidosis, I was always confused what all the terms are, AL, ATTR, so very simple. When you see patients with amyloidosis and they come to your clinic and you see there's a capital letter A, that stands for amyloidosis. And then second you see this is light chain, TTR mutational, that's hereditary amyloidosis. Wild type amyloidosis that's age related, so the transsiretin just becomes clumpy or sticky with age, so that's why patients, especially older men, develop uh, very often um, TTR amyloidosis. Other types of amyloidosis, fibrinogen, apolipoprotein, I mentioned that already. There are certain organs that are predominantly involved in amyloidosis, um, and patients, for instance, with AL amyloidosis. Almost all organs can be involved. This is a nerve system, soft tissue, whereas the wild type TTR amyloidosis mainly affects the hearts or kind of, you know, sometimes the GI tract. So based when patients come, how they present, sometimes we already have a little bit of an idea in which direction it goes. So this is a nice um, work from the Mayo Clinic. Um, the Mayo Clinic has probably the largest population um, for, of amyloidosis, so the evaluated over 5,000 patients which they treated between 1960 and 2009 for the um, percentage of certain types of amyloidosis and you can see most of the patients have primary light chain amyloidosis followed by localized amyloidosis and then senile our uh, TTR amyloidosis and only a fraction or kind of in a very small number of patients have other types of amyloidosis. So how does amyloid develop? Usually monoclonal plasma cells secrete free light chains, they form the amyloid and indirectly we can only measure the tissue damage. There's currently no, and that makes it a little bit hard, there's currently no test that really <coughs> tells us this organ is affected or uh, how many organs are affected or what the extent. Everything is basically an indirect measurement. <coughs> So that results also in the clinical manifestation. Almost all organs can be inf um, affected. Nephrotic syndrome with, renal with or without renal insufficiency. So if you have a patient, uh, for instance, with an MGAS and a nephrotic range proteinuria, think about amyloidosis. That means if the patient loses four gram of protein in the 24 hour urine, that's kind of you now raises a high suspicion for amyloidosis. Peripheral, ne peripheral neuropathy. Carpal tunnel syndrome, very often, we see that very often. And when I ask my patients, you know, have you ever had a carpal tunnel surgery? And they said, yeah, doctor, you know, I had that a couple of years ago. Very often they don't bring it in connection with their amyloidosis. Hepatomegaly, for, uh, because of amyloid involvement, involvement macroglossia, and 
purpura, the typical raccoon <coughs> eyes. Um, that can occur spontaneously or after minor trauma or pressure. Um, they're very typical, but not seen very often. <coughs> so you should also think about amyloidosis when you see your patients suddenly unexplained dyspnea and especially diastolic dysfunction. So when you read, for instance, when I read the echo of an amyloid patient, I don't care about the EF. The ejection fraction is usually preserved. Uh, because the ejection fraction is a volume of what you pump out from the volume you have in. And it's a hypertrophy and you have a small volume. The, uh, uh, <coughs> the left chamber is still able to pump an amount, a potentially good amount of volume out of the heart. But you have to look really for the diastolic dysfunction. That is really important. Um, so left ventricle hypertrophy and the systolic blood pressure below kind of 100, 110. I ask my patients, where you before on blood pressure medication when they come the first time and we kind of you know, try to find out do they have um, amyloidosis, what's going on. Um, I ask my patients, where you on blood pressure medication? And very often they say, yeah, I was, but my doctor stopped it because my blood pressure is low right now. So that should always raise you know, the suspicion to look a little bit, what is the reason for this? I mentioned already proteinuria, hepatomegaly, for um, amyloid involvement, but also for volume overload. Very often we see in our patients an increased ALP that is due to the right heart failure. Autonomic nerve uh, dysfunction, low blood pressure, um, um, that's the main issue we have to deal with. I have patients who have such a low blood pressure that they're not even able to leave the bed. You know, that really brings us, is a huge medical challenge to deal with those patients. Um, MGAS, smoldering myeloma, mild myeloma, Waldenstroms, just think about amyloidosis. When those patients come <coughs> to you and they suddenly have a low blood pressure or heart failure or more shortness of breath, I, I would think about that. Almost all of your patients have an echo and if you look for diastolic dysfunction, it might give you a good hint. Um, <coughs> so how do we make the diagnosis? First, the patient presents with some with symptoms, with a syndrome, then we have to prove um, Kind of that the patient has amyloidosis, usually by a biopsy of an organ, and then we have to make sure that we type the right amyloid. I mentioned already that we have several types of amyloidosis, so it's really important that we do the typing either by immunohistochemistry. It depends on pathology, how familiar your pathology is with the uh, typing of amyloid. At Columbia, they have a pretty good method to digest the amyloid, open up the binding sites for the antibody. That's usually the issue. The amyloid does not bind the antibody. Um, so when their pathology is not able to do this or they have not convincing results or it doesn't fit, they some suddenly say, okay, that's a kappa light chain amyloidosis, but you have lambda light chains in the serum, then you have to discuss with pathology that this cannot be the right uh, typing. Then usually mass spectrometry is the right way to do. And mass spectrometry, um, we don't do that at Columbia. I'm sure you know that. Yeah, we send that usually to Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is excellent. They have an enormous kind of amount of samples and experience. So what we do, we send the samples, the biopsy samples, to the Mayo Clinic, and they um, do a micro dissection of the amyloid. This is a congruent staining. So they cut out the amyloid tissue and then they do mass spectrometry. So they sequence and according to the sequence, they can say, okay, this is probably IgG, lambda, light chain, multiple myeloma, very elegant method. And that really confirms, you know, I would say 99 or 100 percent, you know, that you have amyloidosis. What about prognosis? What determines the prognosis and amyloidosis? It's, um, and it's the heart, it's the heart, and then hematologic response. So we're a little bit lost, you know. So in multiple myeloma, we can achieve responses and we can say you are doing well. And amyloidosis, unfortunately, it really depends on the heart. And then we come in with our treatment. And then next, it depends on the organ response. And at last, the numbers which are involved kind of how high the free light chains are and in contrast to multiple myeloma cytogenetic doesn't really play a big role in amyloidosis so we know that a lot of patients have translocation 1114 that open up new uh, treatment opportunities venetoclax for instance a bcl2 inhibitor so interesting new drug also maybe for amyloidosis but you can see it differs from multiple myeloma um, 
how did we <coughs> came up with uh, response criteria, which also differ from amyloidosis. So Shashi Kumar did a very nice job and evaluated a uh, couple hundred of patients um, for their risk factors. And he found out that one of the risk factor is really the difference in the involved and uninvolved light chains. So if the difference between kappa and lambda light chain is more than 18, you have a higher risk factor for amyloidosis and a poor prognosis. Also, and you see that goes back to the heart of the NT pro-BNT, that's a marker for the stress of the heart, is over 1,800-1,800, or your troponin T is over 0.03. You have additional bad prognostic markers that give you a worse prognosis. So based on this, he established a prognostic scoring system. You can see the difference in the free light chains. More than 18 gives you one point. Troponin T, more than 0.025, another point. NT pro BNP more than 1800 another point you can get three points three points bring you in stage four and stage four has really a grim prognosis you know this is our kind of you know patient population this is stage four with a median oval survival of 5.8 months that really beats multiple myeloma so if the patients come late stage horrible prognosis and that slide tells you the responsibility you as a physician or we as physicians really have you know it's really important especially when you see patients with an MGAS think about amyloidosis because when you have a patient and you um, diagnose a patient earlier you can see stage one the median oval survival 94.1 months they are they are sometimes cured if they come right away they have a low M spike uh, sorry a low difference in the free light chains they have limited organ involvement um, we give an autologous stem cell transplant. They don't even see a lot of chemotherapy. They go in complete remission and they are cured. I have patients who are cured. Um, that's what I think. But 10 years in a complete remission without any amyloid symptoms, that's really, I would say, kind of, you know, a huge progress. Um, we have criteria for the um, response assessment in light chain amyloidosis, which differ a little bit from multiple myeloma. You can see complete remission is always e easy, negative serum and urine immunofixation with a normal free light chain ratio. A VGPR in contrast to multiple myeloma is when the difference between involved and uninvolved light chains is less than 4 or 40 milligram per liter. Um, so that's, I would say, is a main difference. Otherwise, in amyloidosis, we also measure, when I say amyloidosis, sorry, I talk about AL amyloidosis just to uh, make sure. Um, so in AL amyloidosis, we also measure the organ response. And I think what is most important is to measure the cardiac response and progression. Usually we use the NT pro BNP and the troponin T. Here's some kind of, you know, decrease by 30%, 33%, a kind of, you know, determines organ response. Yes, quite often you are true, maybe, that uh, there's a disconnect between the immunological response and in the organ response and improvement. So how do, what is not just advanced stage, I mean, what do we think of this disconnect? Yeah, there can be a total disconnect because you have to, um, what I want to emphasize is the hematologic response, we can achieve pretty fast. Many patients go into complete response after transplant, but the, the, the organ response needs more time. The body needs to be able, or the body has to break down the amyloid, and that takes up to one or two years. And usually it's a race. Then we start the amyloid treatment. We want to bring down the light chain as soon as possible. But patients can, in the meantime, undergo organ failure. So there is a point of no return for your heart or for your kidneys, usually for the heart. So we have patients who die from amyloidosis in complete remission. Yeah. So, you think so this is more the amount of damage that is already there that is difficult to return. That yeah, yeah. That See, when you when the structure of the heart is so damaged, you know, if between the myocytes are so much amyloid, you know, you cannot reverse this. So, and and that's a big problem. And the other problem is the longer you wait and the more organ damage you have, the Le kind of, you know, the less treatment options you have. You cannot do a stem cell transplant. You cannot really be aggressive with your steroids. 40 milligrams of DEX is almost impossible in patients with advanced heart failure. So that's why I think early treatment is really key. It's yeah. interesting because it's somewhat indolent in the beginning. So some people would say we just what? Just not be aggressive and just watch that's the I had an argument with, with a young kind of, you know, amyloid patient. She was 74. She had her stem cells harvested. She was after CYBOD in a complete remission. And what should we do? Should we give her a stem cell or not? So we, we called everybody, you know, we called the Mayo Clinic, Comenso. Everybody said, give her a transplant. She is in good shape. Give her a transplant. That's the best option. Make sure that you eradicate the disease. If the disease comes back, 
I mean, she was very sick, you know, before, couldn't tolerate the transplant, got chemotherapy, got better. What do we do? You really want to eradicate the disease in order to avoid that the disease is coming back. And uh, I would say amyloid is an ugly MGAS. And in contrast to multiple myeloma, we treat in kind of, you know, the MGAS because we know if we wait, it can really result in a very devastating disease damaging the organ damage. Maybe we use our kind of, you know, this for myeloma later and say, you know, you have to treat the disease early. And but this is not an antigenic specificity, but do we know why some patients with fibrillar accumulation have more a cardiac presentation or renal or... There, if you go kind of, you know, really to the kind of, you know, genetics, you will see that the um, certain s certain genetic markers or certain kind of, you know, variants and the light chains kind of, you know, have a predisposition to to the organs. But that's not ready for prime time. It's not that we say, okay, you have this light chain uh, abnormality, you will have, you know, heart amyloidosis. You know, that's there. Some some. Work. How much but, time do I have? But but the tra the tragedy yeah. that happens and is that uh, you know, somebody gets identified as having a monoclonal gammopathy, whether it's smoldering myeloma or an MGUS or whatever, and that you know, the, the decision is made, I'm going to watch this. There's no exactly. clinical justification. So mm. it's that patient who, who, who is, is most important to, to evaluate for mm. evidence. Of, um, I mean, we, we get those patients all the time. They've been watched for 10 years, and now they're finally getting symptomatic from, from their, their amyloid. And, and if we had looked five years earlier or ten years yeah. earlier, we could have yeah. saved their lives or changed their lives. I have patients who had only proteinuria, kidney biopsy, um, amyloidosis, so we, we, we checked the free light chains. The free light chains were normal. So we did the bone marrow. The bone marrow had 3% monoclonal plasma cells. We gave the patient a transplant. Yeah. The patient is kind of, you know, you can see after two years that proteinuria goes down and the patients are doing better. I mean, it's very nice to treat those patients, you know, yeah. when they recover with the organ function, they are cured. Yeah. But that brings me kind of, you know, when do we start treatment? Thank you for the nice kind of, you know, transition to my next topic. Um, so usually patients present when they have symptoms, you know, that's, that's the problem of amyloidosis, what we have. Um, doesn't matter which organ is involved, if you have a patient and you do a fat pad biopsy um, and you determine amyloidosis, you know, usually then we start treatment and we don't wait before they have really organ failure. Um, we also treat localized forms of amyloidosis um, if they kind of, you know, really have um, only, we only treat them when they really have symptoms like I had a patient who couldn't sit anymore because he had big bulks of amyloid and was not able to sit. In those cases, we treat localized amyloidosis. Otherwise, if it is in the um, um, tracheobronchial tract or um, cutaneous lesions, we just wait and watch. So we do nothing with this. Um, clinical trials, I think that's important. Try to put the patients on clinical trials. Um, we discussed goals of therapy, again, deep hematologic response and durable hematologic response rates that can result in organ response. Keep in mind, the, all, the reverse or the breakdown of the amyloid takes one to two years. So even if you're in a complete hematologic response, uh, it takes one to two years before you have organ response. And you only get organ response when you stop the further buildup of the amyloid. That means no light chains, no abnormal light chains. Uh, that's a challenge for all doctors who treat amyloidosis. You need to kind of um, induce a complete remission, but you are very limited by the physical ability of the patients to tolerate transplant. Treatment options, good old melphalan is still an option for amyloidosis, believe it or not. Patients who are really not in good shape very often tolerate melphalan very well. I don't use it very often, but officially um, it's a treatment option. Cyber D, usually we start most of our, of our patients on Cyber D. Autologous stem cell transplant. Um, if you have any doubt that transplant is not really kind of, you know, the key player in multiple myeloma, I think an amyloidosis is a key player. So what we do is very often, uh, if patients do not have a lot of, um, or not a high amount of tumor burden, only a few free light chains, we take them to transplant right away. I don't know how you do this. We don't give any induction. We say, right now you are able to tolerate the transplant. I don't mess around with any cyber D. Maybe you have side effects. Maybe you are, you're not able to tolerate the transplant in four months. I don't know what will happen with your heart. We start the transplant right away. Uh, heart transplant. We do heart transplants, um, not at Columbia, we send them to MGH usually, uh, but in selected cases, patients who are younger, first a heart transplant and then an autologous stem cell transplant. Monoclonal antibodies, I will talk about that. Um, 
Here are some um, data from proteasome in inhibitors. You can see CyberD. It was a very small trial, but I, I think it's pretty well tolerated and has a nice response rate in amyloidosis. So in patients who cannot undergo transplant right away, I usually start with CyberD. Um, transplantation, that's a nice work from Maury Gertz, who evaluated 400 patients. Um, for the outcome in, uh, with cardiac amyloidosis, and you can see patients with a limited cardiac stage have an excellent outcome. Uh, he estimated the transplant-related mortality with around 10%. I think that's a little bit high. We don't see 10%, but maybe we are more selective. It really depends on the center. Yeah, when, when you actually ask him that, he says that the, the the, that 10% transplant related mortality is the same whether they transplant them or not. So it's just that the upfront yeah. mortality rate for <coughs> is high, yeah. is so high. But I think 10% is high. Oh, what do you think? Yeah, transplant related know, really. mortality. Most recent studies are like in the 5% range, but we're yeah. doing more risk adapted decision making. So they're culling out the bad hearts based on what you're showing. But exactly. But that's, the, that's really key, you know, but, that you. But, but that's the point that I want to make is that they're, they're saying we don't want to do transplants on those higher risk patients because the transplant related mortality is so high. But it is, it, it is no higher than if you choose not to do the transplant. You, exactly. You can argue, you, you know, the patient kind of. Their disease either way. Right, 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 that's true. So, but based on his work, he came up on the evaluation of those 400 patients, he came up with some criteria that he would not recommend transplantation with an NT pro BNP above 5,000, uh, troponin T if it is above 0 0.06. Also, there are certain age limitations. I don't agree with the serum creatinine, you know, I would kind of, you know, also transplant patients with a higher serum creatinine. Uh, be careful if more than three organs are involved. Uh, I think that's important. Um, then patients are very often very disappointed when you tell them, you know, transplant eligible, that I tell the patients, you know, only the minority of amyloid patients are really transplant eligible. But, but, but again, the, you know, you have to understand where he's doing his work and why. Is it. So they're at the Mayo Clinic, none of their patients are their patients. They're coming in from outside. And so when they transplant them and they, they have mortality, um, you know, it's, it's on That's a bad reputation if you, yeah, you send but, a patient and the patient but, not coming but, back, but yeah. But the, the, the reality of it is, is that the transplant itself probably isn't contributing as significantly to the mortality rate as you might think it was where you're, where you're doing all the care. So that first six months of care is all in your hands, whereas in the Mayo Clinic, it's, it's either transplant or yeah. go home, so they don't see the mortality rate. Yeah. So uh, I think that a lot of that kind of data and a lot of that kind I, of decision-making th is misleading. I think what we have to keep in mind when he shows the data, mm -hmm. this is for all hematologists, oncologists, for all transplant centers. And uh, it makes a huge difference whether you transplant one amyloid patient a year or whether you transplant 20. So I think, you know, centers like kind of, you know, your center, our center are much more generous and really kind of accepting patients. But when you give a recommendation who to transplant to somebody who doesn't see a lot of amyloid patients, I, I think you have to be a little bit more careful. And that's why he kind of, you know, gives those data. So that gives us a little bit newly diagnosed amyloidosis like multiple myeloma. We decide first transplant eligible or transplant ineligible. If the patient is transplant eligible, very often goes right away to transplant. Um, if there is the goal is, you know, at least to achieve a VGPR, then we go on observation. Uh, if there is no hematologic VGPR, then the patient needs more chemotherapy in order to bring him to a better remission. Um, Does the maintenance help? Yeah, that's a, so officially under the Amyloid experts, there is no role for maintenance in amyloidosis. Um, I have patients I put on maintenance, I shouldn't say that officially, but I have patients who had really kind of, you know, advanced cardiac amyloidosis, were able to, I brought them kind of, you know, through transplant and they still have an M-spike. Should I give them a second transplant? Should I kind of, you know, I give induct, I give a consolidation with two cycles. Still there is some disease left. I give them maintenance, I have to say, you know. I don't do that on all patients. I know you don't believe in maintenance. There's, again, um, I do that in order to kind of, you know, avoid further progression and more organ damage. But officially there's no role for maintenance no in myeloma. But if you, if a lot of these patients go into complete hematologic response. Yeah. They probably don't really? need, yes. Because they don't make, their, their tumor burden is not high. It's because of tissue yeah, deposition. Yeah. 
So they don't need a lot more therapy besides the melphalan because we've eradicated the clone, which is small. And they probably can get by, you know, she may have some patients that if they still had something left, you could argue for potentially doing consolidation or maintenance. But the majority mm -hmm. of these patients get very good hematological responses. Yeah. But we all know that any disease in a complete hematological response has a lot of residual disease, right? And it's hard to measure the MRD in a, in a amyloidosis. <coughs> but but it, with free, free light chains are relatively sensitive, okay. and so we do yep. pick these up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All righty. So. But there's, we talked a lot about chemotherapy, but we still have the urgent need to improve organ response. And that brings me to my next po topic. Um, you can see we are able, and we discussed it, to eradicate the plasma cell clone, but we still have the tissue damage, you know. And that is the question what we discussed, you know, what can we do to really improve the organ damage or help to break down the amyloid? And the idea occurred, I would say, already 30 years ago, as Alan Solomon, the University of Tennessee in Knoxville had the idea to really create monoclonal antibodies that target not free light chains, which are circulating and you produce all the time, but only to target um, light chains that are, that are misfolded and kind of, you know, to target the amyloid directly. So, and um, what he developed, he developed a monoclonal antibody, 11-1-F4, uh, based on a urine of a patient. He collected the urine for three days, uh, was able to extract the protein out of the urine. It was a light chain amyloidosis and uh, immuni immunized um, mice and was able to develop that antibody. And the specificity of that antibody is when you have light chains, you know, this is a native conformation. Um, and when they undergo fibrillogenesis, they form a neoepitope, as you can see here in B. You know, this is not a kind of you know, present in the native state, but when they form fibrils, you see the neoepitope and the antibody binds to that neoepitope shown here in B. So it's very specific for amyloidosis. So what he did is he implanted amyloid pieces subcutaneously into mice, labeled the antibody with iodine and did a mouse PET CT. And I think that's very elegant, as you can see here. Um, the 11-1-F4 antibody binds to the amyloid pieces and lits up in the PET CT. He also showed in mice that he was able to shrink with the antibody, the amyloid pieces. So very, he was very excited about that and said, okay, that's the first time that the antibody might bind to the amyloid directly and helps to break it down. Um, he wanted to do a clinical trial at this time point. I mean, I'm talking about uh, drug development that's probably 20 years ago. Um, but at that time point, the FDA came and said, no, you're not allowed to use your antibody in human. You first have to show that it's binding to amyloid. You have to do a clinical trial um, and show that 11-1-F4 really goes to the organ of the patients. So again, he labeled the antibody similar to the mice studies with iodine, injected the patients with that antibody and did a PET-CT. And the result you can see here. Very nicely, he could show that the amyloid antibody, the 11-1-F4, binds to organ which have amyloid deposition here, a patient um, with a lambda amyloidosis, you know, it goes to the liver but also to the bone marrow. He also did a biopsy of the liver to make sure that the antibody is really present in the tissue and this is, you have to believe me, the yellow dots are Congo red positive and the 11 and a 4 was found in the liver so that was a proof that the antibody is really binding to the amyloid infiltrated organs. That's another patient you can see here. Um, this is the Congo red staining of the biopsy out of the liver. Um, this is the PET CT. Um, so that was very exciting and he was also able to use his antibody not only as a diagnostic tool but also as a marker for response. So he did for instance um, 11 minus 4 imaging of a patient with amyloidosis. You see here the liver 2009, three years later there was a substantially decrease of the amount of the intensity of the uptake. So based on that, um, um, he wanted to start a clinical trial to use that antibody for the treatment of amyloidosis to break down the amyloid in the organs. The FDA gave him finally the okay, but at that time he was 80 years old and said, you know, I'm too old to do this. Um, I give it to Suzanne and to Columbia. So we started the clinical trial with support from the FDA and NCI. NCI produced the antibody. I mean, it's a whole, huge ordeal to do such a trial. Uh, you need the drug under GMP conditions produced, you need quality assessments, stable, uh, stability assessments. So it's a lot of work. Sometimes it 
I spent kind of you know 80 percent of my time to do this. Um, study objective first was just to do kind of you know to establish a maximum tolerated dosage, um, but also we wanted to see whether there's any organ uh, any evidence of organ response. Um, key eligibility criteria. Uh, we were pretty generous with our criteria, good performance status, but you can see patients should have you know, a decent ejection fraction and creatinine clearance. Um, this was our study treatment plan for the phase one. We only gave the drug one time. It was a first in human study, so we were very careful. We started with an extremely low dosage, uh, 0.5 milligram per meter square. We went up to 500. That's in the rituximab kind of range. Um, but again, due to the fact that it was first in human study, uh, we really wanted to know, you know what's, what's the side effects of the study. So the safety summary, it was very well tolerated, I have to say. We, we barely saw side effects. Um, the biggest concern we had was if you have heart amyloidosis and you give the antibody and the antibody breaks down the amyloid, will you completely destroy the structure of the heart and will you undergo heart failure? Um, we didn't see this, so that was, I would say, kind of you know, a big relief uh, for us. But nevertheless, that was the biggest concern. Um, I want to mention one patient really had a grade 3 for a rash, um, and I will show you later that patient. Um, but in general, we saw patients responding very nicely uh, with a dramatic response, especially this patient, you know, with the NT pro BNP. Um, this patient um, was a patient who had the rash. This is his NT pro BNP. He started around 9,000 um, and was doing excellent. This was the response after the phase one treatment, only one treatment. We also put him on the phase two part of the treatment and he had another response. So he developed, unfortunately, around, I would say, a week after we gave him the medication, a full body rash, and we didn't know what, what, what is that rash. Uh, we were not aware that the patient had skin amyloidosis, and what happened in this patient is that the antibody infiltrated the skin, bind, bound to the amyloid, as you can see here, that's kind of, you know, uh, apple green positivity, and we were also able to see um, the special stainings, the antibody around the amyloid. So that was really a good example that the antibody binds to the amyloid and induced um, a local inflammation, a rash, that took a couple of weeks before the rash subsided. Probably the antibody also takes a couple of weeks before you really excrete the antibody. But the patient had a dramatic response, I have to say. Uh, his NT pro BNP went down from around 10,000 to 3,000. Uh, he was almost bedridden with Anazaka, but uh, had another adverse event playing lacrosse with his granddaughter after he finished the trial. So that was a very nice adverse event. I never kind of you know, was happy about you know, a fracture of the pelvis. Um, Organ response, uh, around 60% of that phase one trial had an organ response. Um, we are almost close to finish the phase two, uh, the phase one B trial, um, which is listed here. The phase one B trial kind of, you know, uh, includes a treatment four times weekly. Uh, we will present the data at ASH this year and we have even higher response rates in the phase one B with around 80%. So in conclusion, antibody is well tolerated. We were able to establish the maximum tolerated doses without DLT. We saw organ response in kappa and lambda <coughs> patients in both types of amyloidosis. Again, phase B is ongoing. Um, I hope, you know, I really hope that we can use that antibody not only as a treatment tool, but also as a diagnostic tool. That would be really great to just label it and do a PET CT and see which organs are involved. Uh, we are missing funding from industry, from, from the FDA, but hopefully kind of we have that soon. Uh, we are planning a phase two trial, a SWOC phase two trial with that antibody, but we are not alone. Other researchers had the same idea. I want to mention the NEOD001. It's the same principle. The antibody binds uh, um, conformational change in the structure of the amyloid. Uh, they also presented their data. They have a nice response. Around 60% of the patients have organ improvement under this trial. They are planning or uh, ongoing is a phase three vital trial for newly diagnosed uh, amyloid patients. And we are very excited about this. Um, and that brings me to my last slide already. I think I'm over the time. Um, when you treat amyloidosis or you think about amyloidosis, I think we should try to treat all the patients in clinical trials. It's a rare disease and I think it's important to collect the data. Be certain of the diagnosis. Um, going back in Columbia, we have a couple of patients before my time who were uh, transplanted with TTR amyloidosis, with a senile amyloidosis. That's nonsense. Nothing to do with plasma cell dyscrasia. So I think that's really important. Uh, 
make the diagnosis as soon as possible because it has important implications. Uh, I mentioned the response criteria, many good therapeutic options, but again, clinical trials are the best. Uh, future outlook, I think in the future we will use monoclonal antibodies in parallel, monoclonal antibodies against the amyloid in parallel with the treatment, probably like, right, like we use right toxin for lymphoma. Um, I'm pretty sure that this will come, there is some fine tuning. Um, I want to acknowledge NCI you know, for their funding, especially Solomon who is the father of everything and uh, I kind of you know, have this from Angela Dispensary. I think that reflects all what we have in amyloidosis.